So this is, this is really what it says, okay? This, this, there, there are no major lessons you're gonna take away from this. This is a collection of stories of things that happened to me it, either personally or that I heard about at the time. I, I, I didn't add anything to this. Um, the genesis for this is my grandson, who's gonna be the third, apparently the third generation bass in the computer business, uh, asked me what my first computer was. A and, and I think he was a little bit startled when I said the IBM 7094, because that wasn't in his vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> and then a colleague of mine went to the computer museum, and he came back and he says, geez, you know what they used to do? And I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, uh, so I put together this talk, and the, the people at Saturn were kind enough to uh, give me the opportunity to ramble. Uh, so I graduated in 1964, California, uh, with a bachelor's degree in mathematics. If you had a bachelor's degree in mathematics, you had two possible directions if you wanted to get a job. One was you could be an actuary, and the other was you could be a computer programmer. At that point, the only computer I'd seen was on television. <laughs> so, I mean, my, my hands-on familiarity was not real good. Uh, I took a tour. I actually got to see one at some point. But I had no idea what programming was about. And I got a job, and they gave me a little book on Fortran. I mean, really little. Uh, and they told me to learn it. And so I wrote this program that was in the back of the book, and I. Uh, uh, submitted it, and it didn't work. It didn't work because there were some cards you were supposed to stick in the front that weren't in the book, and it didn't work because the book was on Fortran 2 and I was in Fortran 4. Okay. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about the workflow. So you would type up the submissions on cards, you would place a job card, that's the thing that wasn't in the book, uh, in front, and you gave the cards to the operator. This is a picture of, uh, it's actually a Howarth card. So uh, um, Gregor yesterday talked about Herman Howarth. And he was, he was an employee of the census in 1880. And he realized that if they continued counting people the way they did in 1880, they wouldn't be done by 1890 when they had to do the next census. So he invented a card that looks like this. It was the size of the US dollar. Question? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I only used a punch card. I only used a punch card. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, when, when you wrote Fortran, the first six col uh, five columns were a sequence number that you could branch to as a label. The sixth column was a continuation. In case you had too much to put on one card, you, you put a continuation card. Then you had out to 72 was actually content, programming language content. And here you could put what you want. Uh, people tended to put uh, um, sequence numbers and things like that, but it didn't r really matter. It was mostly ignored. And you sat down at a machine like this, or you had a professional key puncher who sat down at a machine like this. So the first thing I noticed, the place I worked at had professional key punchers, and the head key puncher had her little finger bent back permanently from holding down the shift key. Okay, so, so I think these days that would not be tolerated. This was an O26. A little bit later, they came out with a new model, the O29, I think it was. And this was mechanical. The O29 was more electrical. And it was quiet. And so the first kind of feedback they got was put the punch noise back in so that I know when I've actually punched a card. Uh, you would take this deck of cards. You would give it to an operator. They'd stick it in a card reader. They would load it into a 7094, which looked like that. Uh, you can't see the people's ties. So this was in the day when everybody wore ties. If, if you were in any kind of public visible position. This was in a room with a glass front so that when you, somebody took a tour, they would stand in front of the glass and you could see the computer and the operators. It would come out on a chain printer. So a chain printer had a, a, has uh, uh, all the letters of the alphabet on a chain and they rotate like this and the hammer comes up at the right time.
to, to strike and, and give you the output you want. Uh, the operator would take the cards, put them in a box, and it would take two or three numbers, or two or three hours to get it back with your compiler error. So you spent a fair amount of time bench checking. The other thing that happened is that you ended up with a lot of card decks. Because you're right, working, and you're working on multiple programs because two or three hours you don't just sit there, you go do a, a second program. And you end up with a lot of card decks. And so what happens is you write on the top of these card decks, this is, you know, something or other. Okay, well we have a volunteer here. And so that's okay if you have a thick deck of cards. But one of the tricks of the trade is what happens if you have a skinny deck of cards. And so your assignment is to write Saturn on the top of these cards. And we'll all watch him do this. No, no, on, on the top. So that when I, when I look at it from the top, which is the way it would be in the, in the file folder, I see Saturn up here. That's why we invented padding. padding? Yeah, just add empty cards. Yeah, add empty cards. <laughs> 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 well, not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> okay, so there's this 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 is what he wrote, Saturn, and you can almost read it. Um, there's actually a better technique, which is to make more surface area. And, and, and so if you make more surface area, and you, then you can write, uh, no, if you can write, you can write Saturn in big letters. And then when you put it down, it changes the font, but, but, but it's legible. So that's a trick from the trade that, that got lost. It's, ki it's, it's kind of like uh, um, you know, telling you the tricks of putting on a shoe on a horse. <laughs> but that's a major takeaway from this, this talk. <laughs> well, no, we will learn things. And, and, and as a manager, you will appreciate this next one. So the first thing they did was they gave me an assignment. And there, there, there was something called Legendre polynomials. There is something called Legendre polynomials. And the thing about Legendre polynomials is that it has n factorial uh, divided by m factorial. So remember, I had a, I had a degree in mathematics, right? n factorial is an integer, m factorial is an integer. It took, and, and so this program would work up to, up to an n of 7, and then after that it didn't work. It took me a couple months, I say six weeks, I don't remember exactly, but a couple months to figure out that on the machine I was at, which was a 36-bit machine, 7 factorial overflowed. Okay, uh, factorials were integers. I didn't know any of this real stuff. Who ever heard of overflow? <laughs> and there are lots of better ways to do this, right? I mean, you could factor this before you compute it. So I mean, you know, it's not that it, it, it's not that I, you know, took an appropriate approach. I just took what I thought was right. And so what happened? Well, I we were charged by the hour for, of computer time, uh, uh, which is actually the way the world has turned again. Um, and, and so I had spent six weeks, wasted time, a lot of money, and so we had a meeting. And the meeting was with me, my boss, and my boss's boss. And what was the result? My boss was yelled at for not uh, providing appropriate supervision. It wasn't my fault, it was his fault. I used this for years. It's never your fault, it's your manager's fault. <laughs> And so I did this for a couple years, and, and one of my characteristics is that I have a short attention span, and I get bored e easily, which is good in the computer business because it keeps changing, and so there's always something new to stay in the business. So I went off to graduate school, uh, and I went to Purdue, which at the time was uh, uh, one of the few places that offered PhDs in computer science. And Purdue had just constructed a mathematical sciences building. And they had ordered an IBM 36067 to go in the basement. Okay. Uh, because it's a big machine. What happened? 
Well, it turns out that the IBM 360-67 was a couple years over, so Purdue canceled their order and ordered a CDC 6600, which is another big machine. Why is this interesting? The mathematical science building was designed to have a 67 in the basement. The building was constructed with an elevator to get the computer to the basement. <laughs> the new machine was three inches bigger. They had to redig the elevator shaft. So these, <laughs> these days you, you, you complain about it takes me five minutes to spin up a virtual machine. <laughs> Times were different. Okay, so I got an assistantship as a systems programmer in the high energy physics department. And they had a IBM 360-64, which was cheaper. It was only half a million dollars instead of a million dollars for the machine. And it's what they would call a risk machine these days. Okay, re uh, reduced instruction set computer, which was nice because all of the IBM standard operating systems didn't work and I got the opportunity to to write operating systems, which is where I learned about things like concurrency and so on that's still, still irrelevant. Okay, so here's a picture of it. There's a button right here that is the power button. Bring the thing up. You would bring it up. You would type the date and time on the typewriter because the system didn't remember what the date and time was. You would hit carriage return and the system was booting. You know, it took it a minute to boot. So what happened? I learned to boot the machine. I pushed the button. I entered the date and time, I hit carriage return, the lights went out, bells went off. <laughs> it turns out there was a power failure at exactly that instance. So I'm sitting there with this half a million dollar machine that the lights go out, the bells are ringing, it's my first time. <laughs> but it really wasn't my fault. <laughs> I'm sorry? It wasn't even my boss's fault. You had to go way up the chain to the power company, you know, which is close to God. <laughs> in the scheme of things. Okay, so we were, we were card based. What happens when you use computer cards is that there's a lot of dust in the environment because every time you read it, it scrapes just a little bit off. And so there's a lot of dust in the environment. And IBM, I mean, everybody knew this. And so there was somebody called the uh, preventative maintenance man. Uh, and he would come weekly to uh, vacuum out the machine. And you know, that involved taking a front panel off, lying on the ground, wanding it with his vacuum cleaner, and so on. It turns out that the late 60s and early 70s was a rather uh, interesting time in US history. There was a bomb that went off in a uh, University of Wisconsin computer center that killed somebody uh, by, by some of the anti-war protesters. And so all the other universities put intrusion detections of some sort or another in all their computer centers. So Purdue put a silent button, silent alarm button, underneath the, uh, underneath the console. The IBM repairman came and says, I can't get the front panel off, I can't do my job. So he unscrewed the silent alarm. So what's the consequence? The silent alarm went off, the IBM repairman is lying there with his wand, and police with sawed off shotguns are pointing at him. <laughs> Say, what are you doing there, fella? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if they had a concept of PTSD in those days, <laughs> but I'll bet you he was not comfortable coming back. <laughs> uh, so what are the, some of the other stories? Um, so in 1970, I go out and I get a real job at the university. Well, I became a professor. I shouldn't say that. I became a professor at, at, the, at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, and they had a interactive system. So this was a, a big thing. We didn't actually have to do card decks. You could, but you could also submit things through typewriters. So they had a room full of typewriters that were based on IBM Selectric, Selectrics. They had this little ball that goes back and forth, you hit a key, and it makes the ball go so that you have a hard copy and it sends a signal off to the computer. And the interesting thing you'll get to is in a minute is, is that there's paper that comes up and there's a roll of paper underneath. Uh, 
It got to the computer through something called an acoustic coupler. So you put the, the computer, the typewriter was hooked to a telephone. You put the telephone in a, uh, in, in, a, in a coupler, in the acoustic coupler, and that sent signals. And signals here is a noise signal, and the sound of computing. It's the sound you get if you call a fax machine these days. Uh, uh, off to the computer, which knew how to interpret that and turn that into a digital thing. So this is the best picture I could find. So all these pictures come from Google, Im well, not the last one, but all these pictures come from Google Images. Okay. And so they didn't have, there is an anachronism in this picture. So there's something that shouldn't be there. Does anybody see what it is? The touchtone phone, yeah, the touchtone phone didn't actually come out till the middle 70s. So this picture was nominally 1970. And there shouldn't, it shouldn't have been a touchtone phone. It should have been another kind of phone. Okay. But that was the best I could do. OK. There was one operational problem. And this I didn't actually see, but I was told. Um, there was a, a female student who got her hair caught <laughs> in the platen, in the thing that went around. OK. And what do you do if you're, you know, your hair is caught? You struggle. And every time she struggled, she'd hit the carriage return. And what happens when you hit the carriage return? It advances. So <laughs> she kept getting pulled further and further down. <laughs> you know, this is not a pleasant experience, I would assume. So what happened is I was teaching the beginning programming class. The first thing the students had to do was find the off button. <laughs> if you get in trouble in the, computer, in the computer room, don't ask for help. Just turn the thing off. You're in charge. That was, that was the consequence. And the other thing that happened was that people had much shorter hair in the 70s than they did in the 60s. Now, I'm not saying it's because of this effect, <laughs> but, 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 you know, a uh, uh, coincidence is not ca causality, but there certainly is suggestive. <laughs> God, I'm whipping through this. It took me a lot longer last time I did this. So here's a picture somebody took of me in 1980. So I used to be young. I just. <laughs> One of the messages, I used to be young. So I'm sitting in front of something. Does anybody, well, you, you old guys would know, but any, anybody that, you know, know what that is? It's a VT220, yeah, yeah. So, so this is a digital equipment uh, terminal. It mimicked the, the, the IBM card. It had uh, 80 column width. You type characters in it. It also had a direct access kind of mode, so you could, you could put things in the middle of the screen and so on. You couldn't put any kind of visualization, but you could put character kind of visualizations. Okay. What, what about that? That's a nine-track tape. We still use nine-track tapes, right? Anybody know? I'm told that, that nine-track tapes are still part of the, uh, 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 of the inventory in, in, in IT shops. I don't know. Uh, um, and then this thing, you old guys ought to know this. It's the right ring. So one of the bad things that can happen is that you overwrite what's on the tape. And so the way you protect against that is if this ring is not in, the tape drive will not write. And so if you had something you wanted to protect, you took the right ring out. If you had something you didn't want to protect, you know, you, you really intended to write over it, um, you could put it back in. One of the experiences I had at, um, as a graduate student was that the system told me, are you sure you want to write on this tape? I said, sure. You know. Right? <laughs> is this okay? I mean, it's just like hitting the okay button when somebody gives you this, all this legal stuff. It was some graduate student's data that was you know, critical to his thesis. So, so I never owned up to, until now, I never owned up and <laughs> to destroying his data. But, but uh, uh, I assume he reproduced it and graduated. So I was assuming you were going to do the presentation for data and instruction? Or no, okay. So, The, no. So you're thinking about paper tapes, probably. Um, no, how long that sort of, I mean, I have some problems in there. 
Okay, so, so I mean, one of the things you learn somewhere in your computer science curriculum is that everything's a number. <laughs> Instructions are encoded as numbers and data is coded as numbers. And as far as the tape is concerned, you just write uh, uh, numbers to it. It's when you read it back in, the question is how you interpret it. Uh, um, and I was never in an environment where tapes for code were separated from tapes for data. Different people did. I mean, I didn't have any data on my tapes. They were all code data, code things. And, and that would be all code. But inherently, there's no particular reason for doing that. Uh, so I was coding Fortran. So one of the things, so, so this is me. I, I got a job as a consultant with the Environmental Protection Agency. So in Rhode Island is on the coast of the US, for those that don't know, uh, right near the coast of, the, uh, uh, of Rhode Island, or part of the coast of the Rhode Island, is the Narragansett Bay. And so there was a water quality lab of the Environmental Protection Agency. That's a good story. I'll tell that one, too. Uh, there. One of the things I did for amusement as a, uh, while I was a professor, was I, I, I joined a pottery studio. So there was the, art, the art association ran a pottery workshop. And uh, I, was, I was part of that. I made some pieces of pottery that probably still exist somewhere, but you wouldn't want to see. Uh, one of the other potters happened to be in a position of authority at this Environmental Protection Agency Water Quality Lab. He said, we just got a new computer. Why don't you come tell us what we can do with it? It turns out simultaneously they were being, okay, so the Environmental Protection Agency sued the city of Philadelphia because it was dumping garbage in the ocean. And they wanted to make them stop, so they dumped the garbage on the land. Because uh, it was a water quality land. The land quality people were a different lab. <laughs> and, and so what happened was that they did all these scientific experiments. And they sent divers into the garbage and, 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 and you know, they saw fish with mutations and, 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 and you know, I mean, it, was, it wasn't pleasant for the divers. And they took them to court, and they lost some of the data. It was all being managed manually. And so he said, you know, we have this problem with data management. Uh, do you think this new computer that we got can help us? So at the time, I had never written a program in ALGO. So I said, sure, and this was my opportunity to write an ALGO program. <laughs> so I wrote something in ALGO. Uh, it turned out to be useful. And they said, oh, you know, what you've done is good, but we need more. And so I rewrote it in Fortran, because I, that was a language I was comfortable with. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I built a system that survived until, so it survived for about 10 years, um, until they got Oracle and a bigger computer. So there were several bigger computers along the way. So this is more than likely me coding in Fortran. Uh, OK, so this took a lot shorter time than I thought. So, so <laughs> well, the VT220 only, only understood uh, uh, you know, the, the, the QWERTY <laughs> keyboard. Yeah. Well, so, so uh, I mean, I don't have any pictures. I, I, I can talk. I mean, if people want me to keep on talking, I can talk. Um, <laughs> so um, what happened in 1986, so 1986, I've graduated to be chairman of the department. Um, and it didn't take me very long to realize that that was not something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So here, <laughs> here I was, you know what, in the early 40s, chairman of a computer science department. The only career path I could foresee was either being a professor, which, which turns out to be really boring, actually, <laughs> or, or, or moving up to be a dean, which, which may be not boring, but is certainly not a, what, something I would wish on, on anybody but my enemies. 
Um, <laughs> and, and so it was time for me to find another job. It took me a couple years. Uh, but at the same time, they, they started the Software Engineering Institute, and they were hiring anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I got a job at the Software Engineering Institute. There was another faculty member at the University of Rhode Island that did that. And it was kind of interesting, because Carnegie, the other people in my position were from Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon is one of those places where they take care of the faculty. University of Rhode Island is one of those places where the faculty takes care of themselves. Moving to the SEI, it turns out that having a skill of knowing how to take care of yourself is really very useful. <laughs> so I resigned my tenured position. I burned my bridges. I, I go off to Pittsburgh. I move my family. I sell my house. First day at work, there's a sign we're having an all-hands meeting. I said, oh, nice. You know, that, 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 that's, that's nice of them. You know, th when I get there. I get there and they announced that the director decided to retire over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so the basis on which I was hired disappeared. Okay, I was hired to do, do some things relatively similar to what, the, uh, what, what I'd been doing. Um, if I'd been clever in this new position, I would have invented the World Wide Web. But A, I'm not that clever, and B, I wasn't given the opportunity. So somebody else had to do it, is what happened. Uh, and so I sort of hung around for a while. And then somebody uh, in the, uh, they, they got another director. And somebody in, in, in the chain of command uh, decided that I should be put to useful kinds of work. And I became a user interface software person. And he took me around to the various hotspots in user interface software for a while. So there, there, there's a story there. So this guy's name was Dick Martin, is Dick Martin. Uh, and he had been involved in the US Navy and used a lot of experimental software on ships. And one of the projects that he'd been involved with touched on the MIT Media Lab, which was just getting started. So he said, we should go to the Media Lab, and you can find out the interesting things they're doing. So the head of the Media Lab was Nick Negroponte. Can't still be head. Uh, uh, and so he called him up. He said, Nick, this is Dick. Uh, when can we come? And you know, we scheduled something. We went off to the, to the, to the Media Lab. We also, uh, on this, not the same tour, but in the same process, we went to Xerox Labs. We talked to Stu Card and saw the stuff that was going on there. We went to some place in Texas where they were doing uh, uh, simulations of, of planes flying through valleys and so on. Uh, the Media Lab story is interesting because about five years later, he said, we should go back to the Media Lab and see what they're doing now. So he calls them up and he says, Nick, this is Dick. And Nick says, we have visitor schedules uh, uh, where, we, where we take people on tours on such and such a day. Why don't you sign up for one of those? So we went from being anything you want to you know, one of a visitor. About three years later, he called him up again and said, OK, Nick, this is Dick. And Nick said, who? <laughs> <laughs> so the media lab got bigger, got more popular. The people's heads got bigger. This is a, this is a normal process. Um, and so. I went from doing, building user, so, so the kinds of user interface software that I was building were, had to do with how the software is structured. So it had to do with the architecture of the overall system. Uh, it was something called user interface management systems, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but uh, uh, haven't really proved out. Um, and that got me interested in software architecture. So. At the time, there were two or three domains where software architecture was sort of recognized. Databases had the notion of software architecture. You, you had the physical layer, the, the, the uh, mapping layer, the, the user layer. I forget the terms anymore. Uh, uh, compilers had notions of software architecture. Uh, and the user interface people had notions of software architecture. So I, so I spent a fair amount of time exploring notions of software architecture. 
And that's what got me into architectural evaluation, because I would go to these places and people would say, my user interface management system is better than your user interface management system. And we would have this sort of contest, you know, to see who could shout louder. Um, that didn't seem like a very principled way to do it. And then I had some conversations with people, or one of whom was Rick Kaysman, um, uh, but another one was a formal methods guy. And so, you know, through this conversation with the formal methods, the formal methods guy kept saying, well, you really need to make it so it doesn't have any errors. And I would say, no, you really have to make it so it's easy to modify, which is what the, uh, the user interface perspective would be. And I finally came to the realization that, you know, he was, he was privileging one quality attribute over another, and I was, had a reverse priority. So, so all of a sudden, the notion of what qualities do you have and how are they prioritized got there. And that's what led into, initially, SAM, which uh, uh, was, was a method um, for evaluating uh, 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 architectures on for modifiability in, into uh, uh, ATAM, which didn't care what quality attributes you're interested in. So ATAM is, is a method that you can use to investigate tomato picking. Uh, uh, doesn't have to be software. Just a different set of quality attributes. Um, and it's really good at, the method is really good at getting you to look at the right things. Once you get to looking at the right things, then you have to know what you're looking for and what you're doing. So, so it's not uh, totally smart people doing smart things. It's smart people being guided by a process that gets them to the point where they can do smart things. So it makes you more efficient and, it, and it's more uh, uh, trainable. Uh, so that, that, that was, that's skipping over the last, uh, you know, that's skipping over 10 years. Uh, but from being a user interface guy, I was a software architect. I got interested in software architecture and there was, there was a flight simulator project that, uh, that was going on. So one of the things I did at the SEI was I canceled the user interface project. So it turns out that this is again an example of my having a short attention span. Um, and we built this system, we released this system, and I said, I want to go do something else. And the something else turned out to end up being the flight simulator thing, which I guess has a little bit to do with user interfaces. Uh, actually, quite a bit to do with user interfaces, but more has to do with airplanes and stuff. So I worked on flight simulators for a while, uh, which again was, was more software architecture. Uh, and then, then the same guy, Dick Martin, uh, uh, got involved with the CMU wearable computer project. So this was 1990, we're now at 1995. The fact that I'd gone to the SEI and you know, met the director on his way out was sort of in the past. You know, this was a, a, turned out to have been a good thing to do, not a bad thing to do. Uh, so, so I started putting my time, so then, then I stepped down as being a manager. I said, I don't want to be a manager anymore. Uh, uh, and so I can go play. So that's what happens. That, that if, if, if you're a manager and you're in an organization that lets you be not a manager, it gives you things to play. You can go play. So I went and played with gadgets. Okay, well these days wearable computers, you know, Google Glasses and all that kind of stuff uh, are, 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 are pretty, uh, I don't think I have any pictures of, of that stuff, are, are pretty standard. In those days it was, it was very, uh, uh, unusual. So there were, there were two communities that, that dealt with wearable computers. The CMU people viewed wearable computers as a tool that would be used in industry. And so we had projects and classes, and the projects all involved, let's find somebody that has a process that is manually based that you can't do in a small space. So examine a bridge to find defects. Look at an airplane to see uh, uh, if there are any cracks. Look at a tank to see which pieces need to be replaced. Big devices that you can't take anywhere. Uh, and put all the information on a wearable computer and uh, see how much the process has improved. And we would get paid for this. So this was a research effort. We were getting paid by the US government. We were getting paid by uh, uh, the clients, and the students were paying tuition. 
So what would happen is that they would discover that using this computer improved their productivity of the, of the customer by about a factor of 10, pretty typically, because they're going from a manual process to an automated process. And they would say, this is great. We want to order 50 computers. It turns out that broke our funding model. You can get students to pay you to be able to build one. It's really hard to get the students to pay you to build 50. You can get the government to pay you to build one. That's research. It's really hard to get the government to pay you to build 50, because you're not doing any more research. And so we wandered around trying to find a company that would build these things. And, and that was, I would say, more or less my first experience with scale economic scale, not, not computer scale. Because we started with the, you know, we went to Apple, we went to uh, uh, Sun, we went to all the big, we went to Dell, we went to the big computer manufacturers, and their question was, how many of these things do you see selling? And our answer was maybe 10,000. And their response was, we won't invest in something unless it makes a big significant difference in our bottom line. Well, when you have a billion dollar company, a significant bottom line is not 10,000 <laughs> new units. <laughs> Got to be 100,000 or, or maybe half a million. And so we sort of drifted down the food tree chain uh, uh, until we found somebody that would make these things. And other people were making them, so the hardware component kind of disappeared uh, off the radar. The software component um, grew into a company that uh, uh, existed in Pittsburgh I think it's still in Pittsburgh. It existed in Pittsburgh for, for 10 years. Uh, recently got bought by Boeing. So it still exists in P Pittsburgh, but it's no longer independent. Uh, uh, and Dick went off to be one of the principals of, of that and left CMU. Uh, so that from my perspective, that lasted from 1995, more or less, to, uh, to 1998. So what happened in 1998? Uh, at that point, we started writing a book on software architecture. Um, you know, and so, uh, so there was writing a book. There was working on ATAM. There was working on design methods. There was a lot of software. So software architecture turned out to be a fairly rich domain. And, and, and so there was a lot of, uh, that kept me busy for a large number of years, more, more, more than typical. Uh, and then in, uh, what was it? So, so that kept me busy for a long time. Uh, in 19, no, in 2011, I decided I'd had enough of the SEI. And offline, we can discuss why that was. Uh, um, and I went off to Australia, where I got involved in operations. So the group that I went to in Australia had been working on a disaster recovery system. So. At the time, you know, I, I had been an application or a systems programmer, and so disaster recovery was near, not, really not on my horizon. You would back things up to one of these tapes that I showed you, and if there was a disaster, you would bring it back. No big deal. Um, it turns out it was a big deal. <laughs> the other disaster recovery story that I had was sometime in the mid-'70s, I ran into an insurance company that, that, that understood that disaster recovery was a big deal. So every Every night at midnight, they would back up their database to a collection of tapes. They would put it in a car. This car would drive on a random, this was around Boston someplace. This car would drive on a random route for the next 24 hours, after which it would come back, and they would have done it again. So they didn't have a predictable route so that nobody could, uh, nobody could hijack the car. Um, and they had a backup. They, could, they would go back to the previous night at midnight in case of a disaster. Uh, so that was my only connection to disaster recovery until I, I went to Australia. And one of my tasks in Australia was to try and set an agenda for, for the group there. And I got intrigued with this whole operations question. So disaster recovery is one aspect of operations in the cloud, deployments another aspect of operations. And that kind of led me into, into DevOps which is sort of where I position myself these days. Um, and uh, this is, so, you know, buy the book. <laughs> I have to plug the book. Uh, uh, and 
that led me to uh, uh, that led me back back to to Saturn. So one of the stories I tell about Saturn is that when I was at the SEI, Saturn was a chore. Oh God, Saturn's coming, and I have to think about what to say. I have to go, you know, go meet these same people. I'm tired of meeting these people. Blah blah blah. Uh, once I left the SEI, I, st I, I came to Saturn last year for the first time in about three or four years, and, and, and I enjoyed myself, which was kind of a surprise. So, so uh, <laughs> Saturn had changed a lot without me, is kind of what happened. And, and, and instead of being an SEI dog and pony show, it's become what it is today, which is really an industry forum. And, and, and it's a much more pleasant, at least for me, it's been a much more pleasant kind of place to be than, uh, the, the, than the SEI dog and pony show. Um, so does anybody have any questions? I mean, I, yeah. oh, so then the other thing was, you know, I enjoyed myself at Australia, but then my wife says it was time to come back to the U.S. So I've been married a long time. I, I, <laughs> I, I know when I'm given an order, I should obey. <laughs> so we moved back to the U.S. And, and now I'm located in Pittsburgh, uh, near Pittsburgh, uh, Swickley, if you're a Pittsburgh person. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and I come to Saturn. <laughs> So other kinds of questions? Do people have questions of me? Do uh, people have stories of their own? I mean, I got a lot of time here. <laughs> we have a lot of time. No one have any stories? Last time I gave this, people were talking about their stories. Does somebody use punch tape? I never dealt with punch tape. Okay, John, tell me a story. Okay, a discat, yeah. Yeah. So. So, uh, in my experience, uh, the, the, the same problem in the 80s are the similar problems in the in the thousand. <laughs> the uh, software architecture problems is is continually in this time. So, uh, but there are a lot of new technology, but we we need continuous improvement the methodologies, the integration of the teams, and something like that. Is, uh, the problems are the same problem. The context is different. Yeah, so yeah the, problems, the problems on the one hand are the same, and the other they're influenced by the technology you're applying them to. So I guess for better or worse that it's been exposed and used, all of these things. But punch tape um, uh, was interesting stuff. So it's a paper strip, you know, about an inch or so uh, wide. And if I remember rightly, you could put five holes in it across, uh, little round holes. So it was a BCD? Yeah, sort of with some parody or yeah. something like that that was going on. And um, uh, it was, the cheap stuff was just paper. Um, and it would rip. And so that was okay if you were a student writing programs that you were gonna run once or twice, but I um, uh, used to use a deck computer where you booted the system off of paper tape, and then from there you could read cards or disk or whatever, but to boot it you needed the paper tape. And so you know, reading it and reading it and reading it, um, you didn't want it to break, so they had this tape that was um, not plastic, but it was sort of impregnated with some stuff that made it harder to tear. Um, the downside was they also, um, it had like a little oil film on it. And so if you weren't careful, you wound up with um, oil stains all over your clothes because you held the stuff in your hands and then you wiped your shirt. And, um, and it also didn't go very well with the other thing I was doing, which was building, um, like hardware and so you would have this tape and then you'd have a clean room environment and obviously those things don't go well together so um, so so one of the things you could do with with with, with cards so so John talked about paper tape ripping there were splicing machines so you could glue them together one of the things you could do with cards um, this sequence of holes here represents a character right so this is an encoding uh, uh, it was BCD at the time, binary coded decimal, which was a six-bit thing. It later went to an eight-bit thing. Um, and 
If you wanted to make a small change, what you did was you got a chad, which is the thing that got punched out. You put it in here. You re duplicated the card. So one of the things a card reader would do was, was, was you put a card in and it would duplicate it. You would duplicate the card and it would come out and this column would be empty. And then you could punch what you wanted in there. <laughs> and so, so you could edit these things. I once had a, uh, the head of the systems group at the place that I worked at first, I saw him sit there with a card, and this was, this was machine language, reading the instructions, saying, okay, this is a this instruction followed by a that instruction followed by another instruction. Very impressive that he could read the whole. You know, uh, uh, and, and so there were a lot of things that you did with the cards that you, well, you still do sort of. I mean, you, you can do binary patches uh, uh, onto, onto source things, I mean, onto binary things. So it's almost the same. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, when I went to college, um, before, before college in, in high school, a friend, a friend of mine, his father had an apple. So that was great. Uh, I worked on the apple. But then I went to college, and this was uh, in uh, Louvain in Belgium. Uh, very well-known university, very old, one of the first universities in Europe, but a little bit behind as far as computers go. So we had to use uh, punch cards and a chain printer, uh, Q physically to get the output of the program. So the interesting thing is, uh, yeah, first year in college programs are kind of small, but then other people, graduate students, they have these very large stacks of cards, uh, which they put in boxes. Uh, and then several boxes, shoe boxes, whatever, and then you better hope you that they don't uh, they don't fall on the floor because then that's a major disaster because there's no clear ordering ordering on those cards. Um, but the interesting thing is, so uh, this was a, a shared computer, and people had to enter credentials. So at the beginning of the job, there's a username on one card, and then the password on the other card. Of course, passwords. Um, if I remember well, you don't have the text printed on the card, but that's kind of moot because, I mean, the password is there in the holes. Um, yeah, of course, first year in college, you want to do exciting stuff on the computer, but they give you this very limited account. But then people would just stack their boxes all over in the, in the computer rooms, and they would just go have a look at one of the really big stacks because <laughs> that means a really powerful account, and then you could like just like borrow a bit of their time, they wouldn't even notice. Right? So, so I'll get back to you in a minute, but, but you reminded me of another story. So what happens is that, uh, oops, wrong way. The operator would take the cards out of the box and, and stick them in the card reader. He had a big box, took more than one hand. So they would take a handful here and a handful here and put it there. One time an operator came to me with two handfuls and says, does it go this way or that way? Not to write on the top of the card. What we used to do was put a stripe. You put a stripe on the top of the card, yes. You put the stripe diagonally so that if they fell on the floor, you could start putting them back together based on the direction of the stripe. Green deck and the green and red deck and the green red blue deck and uh, <laughs> now where did the where did the card go? So in theory, that's what these things were for. So so there were also card sorting machines, so that you would stick the cards in, they would sort them based on these numbers, and so you'd put them once in where you sorted based on the last number, and then you'd run them through again where you sorted them based on the next number. And, 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 and that was called terminal digit sorting, which I actually used one time in, in the database world. Uh, so yes, you could automatically, but if you automatically added the sequence, you couldn't stick any cards in the middle. Yes. Yeah, so you tended not to do that. Okay, more stories. Well, not a story for me, a question. A question, um, okay. So you mentioned you, you got into architecture at some point through your history. How has being an architect or doing the process of architecting changed over the years, if at all? 
a less than I would have hoped. <laughs> <laughs> so we've developed techniques. Uh, we've developed methods, which uh, some of which are quite powerful. Uh, the take up of, I was shocked at one of the talks, uh, where'd you go, there. Uh, you, you ask how many people have done a QAW and almost everybody in the room raised their hand. You know, that, that's kind of self-selecting, but you still will see uh, requirements that, that, you know, make this fast, make this reliable without any sort of sense to it. So I would say uh, uh, less than you had hoped. So now what happens is that, at least my view of the world today, is that you actually have tiers of companies. Uh, so people like Google and Netflix and so on are really very architecture centric, regardless of what they said. And I think you saw that at the, at the uh, earlier talk in this room. Uh, and you look at the Netflix stuff, and they're very architecturally sensitive, and, and very architect they, 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 they understand what they're doing. Um, there's, there's a set of enterprise companies that are architecturally sophisticated. They have architectural training courses. They, they have various kinds of certification, and so on. And then there are another set that really have no idea what they're doing. Uh, um, so I would say the practice of being an architect over the years has depends on which one of those categories you fall. If you're in the last category, it hasn't changed at all. <laughs> if you're in the middle category, you now know a bunch more tools and a bunch more techniques that you can bring to bear. Of course, the world has changed so that things are more complicated now than they used to be. I was kind of, I mean, that was the question I asked when, when, when if for those that were in the talk uh, uh, from Google here at, at 9 o'clock, Jack Green, Greenfield, uh, uh, put up a list of issues involved in moving to containerization. It was a long list, each one of which was very complicated, uh, some of which I hadn't heard of before. Uh, uh, and so if you're going to operate in that environment, you have to spend a lot more time understanding technology than you used to. Used to be technology was actually the simple part of it. And now I think technology has gotten to be the more complicated part. The rest of it, in terms of the architect as a senior technical lead and so on, I don't think has changed. I think that's the way it was in the 90s and the 80s. And I think that's still the way it is. Um, so from my limited perspective, that's the, the, that's the answer. Other questions or, or stories? Yeah. Did the did the operator do anything more than just put the cards in the card reader? Did the operator do anything more than just put the cards in the card reader? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So. The operator put the cards in the card reader. The operator changed these tapes here. Sometimes the cards had required data. The operator would change those tapes. Um, the operator would make sure there was always paper in the printer, would rip the paper off the printer for each job. It's perforated. And so uh, uh, when the printer broke, the operator would replace the chain. Um, the operator would recognize the fact that something went wrong and call the IBM repairman typically, who was a more sophisticated repairman than the one doing the uh, the, the, the vacuuming. Um, and the operators typically were in charge of giving tours. <laughs> so there wasn't much of a notion of system administration in those days. Uh, so system admi so, so the sequence of terminology or, or, or job responsibilities has changed over the years. So it used to be you just had operators. You didn't really have system administrators. You had operating systems people. And the operating systems people were the ones responsible for loading the new version of the operating system in uh, um, you know, and, and making sure that everything worked and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and then what happened when networks came in was all of a sudden the, somebody needed to manage the network, and you could do things remotely. So these were single-use machines. So when I was a systems programmer in the, in, at Purdue, I worked at night. You know, I mean, 
you know, because people were using the machine for, for their production purposes during the day. So you had to sign up for test things. You, you know, it was sort of off hours. Uh, uh, as soon as you got networks and virtualization, which is the late 60s and early 70s, you, you, know, you could start to uh, uh, do these things remotely. You could start to do these things anytime, day or night. Uh, and so when networks came in, you, you got this function of system administrator who, who essentially babysat the network. You know, is everything working? Did disk break? Uh, uh, and, and so on. These days, operators are back to where they were originally. So an operator is, this, I mean, as, as Jeremy said, the operator is the person that changes the disk when it breaks and makes sure all the cables are connected and so on. System administrators depends on your organization whether you still have them or not. Uh, uh, in Google, they moved the system administration function off to uh, uh, a separate team. But that gets more complicated too because let's suppose you have an intruder in your system. If you don't have somebody looking over the whole installation, then that's going to get referred to some application team who's got to figure out that this is an intruder, not a problem with my software, and then react to it. And so, you know, this whole, one of the DevOps debates is, are operators and system administrators obsolete? And do we move everything to the application teams? And you can argue both ways. If you have a problem with the application and it has to go through the operator to recognize it and get off to the application programmer, that's a delay. On the other hand, if you have an intruder and it goes first to the application and then to somebody who does intrusion what, reco recovery, uh, that's a delay too. So you can argue that both ways. Um, but, uh, uh, but in those days, the operators just did, did the mechanical things, which you didn't know if you took a tour. So the first time I took a tour, I thought these people were important. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, A, a they wore a tie, but I wore a tie, too. I mean, everybody wore a tie. So, so one, of, one of the things I learned early was, was uh, if, if, if you come to work neatly dressed, tie, sports coat, you hang up your sports coat, you roll up your sleeves, you loosen your tie, you walk around looking distracted, everybody thinks you're thinking, and they won't interrupt you. <laughs> so a good way not to be not to be messed with is, 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 to, is to look rumpled and walk, and I, I haven't recovered from that really, <laughs> and, and, and look distracted. Uh, um, uh, but no, operator, operators were the bottom of the totem pole initially. Other questions or uh, comments? Yeah. I don't know, a small story question. Sure, um, more stories the better. When I went to college, when I went to college, um, my dad kind of looked up what he had from college to give me. And he gave me two things. And the first thing was a, a book about integrals and techniques of solving integrals. And I, it was actually very useful. I use it for class, and it, it kind of it, it stays the same. Right? And the other thing he gave me was one of those punch cards. <laughs> and all I could do was use it as a bookmark for the, for the book he gave me. <laughs> but no. it was really nice. I mean, no, no, no. The punch cards were incredibly useful. You could, they, they fit in your pocket. They were great for taking notes. You know, just the right size. And bookmarks. And bookmarks, too, yeah. <laughs> but, but fundamentally, nothing has replaced the punch card. I use, I use old business cards now to take notes. You know, it's not as good. <laughs> so it, it was really interesting to see how the, the things that we were taught in math haven't changed much, but how things evolved in, in yeah. computer science. Uh, um, so, so somebody told me that there are 3 million cards left, punch cards, and the computer museum has them. And when they use them up, they're all gone. <laughs> I don't know if this is true or not, but that, that you know, that's what somebody told, told me. So okay, so yeah. I had a question. Yeah. Um, have you seen, uh, or from the different things you've seen, um, areas of software that um, require more or benefit more of software architecture? Areas of software that benefit more from software architecture. I mean, considering embedded. Um, web services, um, the, the whole thing. So when I worked with, so one of the, th I didn't mention in my, in my history, but one of the companies that I worked with for a while was Robert Boss, uh, um, and they're an automotive supplier. And 
so I'll tell a story and then I'll get get to your to get to your question. So 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 if you think about a window lifter, that's a piece of plastic connected to another piece of plastic that makes the window go up and down. Four dollars max, or maybe ten by the time you build in, you know, markups and stuff. If you think about computerizing it, you want to make it automatically stop when your kid puts their head in the window. And so it's got to recognize the fact that there's an obstacle. Okay, so, so all of a sudden it's gotten more complicated. Uh, it turns out that over time, the, and so what it does is, is you set it up so that there's a certain resistance that it recognizes and it will stop when it hits that resistance. Different, different rules in the US and Europe, but the same concept. Uh, over time, the automobile body warps. And so the amount of resistance that you, you have in the thing changes. A and and it, it has to remember what it took last time. And so you've gone from a, a, a $10 piece of plastic, or two pieces of plastic, to 50,000 lines of code. And I haven't discussed the fact that Robert Bosch supplies window lifters for Mercedes, for BMW, for Volvo, for, for virtually every automotive company. And so each one has a different, slightly different set of user interfaces. Okay, so, you know, question. If, if the driver does something and the passenger does something with the same window, who wins? Okay, you might have different rules. Uh, you have an external, you know, I want to close my windows from the internet because I forgot, it started raining. Okay, that's yet another interface. And, and, and so, you know, you're talking about 150,000 lines of code now for something that's incredibly conceptually simple. And certainly that's an architectural kind of, kind of thing. So I would say that the kinds of systems that don't benefit from architecture are the ones that are small, a couple thousand lines, and I don't know that they exist anymore. You know, I mean, you look at the Internet of Things, and yes, it's just a sensor, and the sensor sends its readings, but then it turns out that by the time you add all the other things that it's supposed to do, um, it gets to be a substantial amount of code, and it needs some sort of middleware in order to navigate the, the communication and so on and so forth. So, so my feeling is that the only kind of software that doesn't benefit from architectural perspective is the kind of software you can keep in your head about what it is, and that's, I don't know, 10,000 lines of code or maybe 20,000 if you're really smart. Uh, you, you spoke earlier about um, reliability a little bit, but, but how is the reliability of, of those systems? I mean, I mean, you spoke about the, the guy coming to vacuum clean the dust from the computer every week. But uh, okay, I mean so, so there was a case um, with the IBM 74 where the, okay, so the, the, the word representation for floating point numbers had a sign bit. There was a, a case where the sign bit was erratically wrong. Okay, it was hardware. And so it, it would, uh, occasionally give you the wrong numbers, but not repeatedly. Okay, so that that took a long time to figure out. Uh, uh, these things are. There was another case where the fans broke, and the and the core memory, the memory inside was core. It melted. <laughs> okay, it didn't take long to figure out, but it took a long time to fix. Um, so I would say these things were not particularly reliable. Um, there wasn't a lot of redundancy. And the way you get reliability, well, at least one way you get reliability is through redundancy. And there wasn't a lot of redundancy in there because they were really expensive. Uh, uh, and so there were, I don't know how the reliability figures compare to today, but I would say that probably you know, substantially less. You know, that there were a number of things that could go wrong. There wasn't redundancy in it to correct if they went wrong. And so you just had to, to figure it out. Now, from an application programmer, you don't notice that. Well, you would notice it occasionally. So mostly you wouldn't notice it because you put your job in and after a while it came back. Okay, in fact, it was two or three hours or six hours. You know, that's just the turnaround time that you got. So you didn't really notice that something was wrong with the machine in the middle. The time you would notice is if you had a long-running program. So there were things that took a long time. 
And what you would do then is you would checkpoint periodically uh, so that when it crashed, you could pick up, you wouldn't have lost anything. You would pick up from, uh, uh, from, from where the last time you did a checkpoint. Uh, uh, and then you would notice. So over, something that ran continually overnight was actually pretty good. Other? How do you do debugging then? Oh, debugging. Oh, good question. So my grandson asked that too, you know. Uh, <laughs> And, and the last actual coding that I did was, was, was some JavaScript uh, uh, and front-end jQuery, front-end kind of stuff. Uh, geez, it's been almost 10 years now. And that was like a throwback to the old days. You didn't have any debuggers. <laughs> you didn't have any kind of, of, of tracers. You know, you didn't. So what you did was you put write statements everywhere and, and under, under some sort of parameter control. And, uh, uh, you would do a binary search, okay? The end is wrong, okay? Let me try it halfway, and so on. Um, when, when I moved to be an, and that was an application programmer kind of technique. Uh, when I moved to being a system programmer, it got worse, because you couldn't put a right statement. <laughs> and so what you would do is you would take core dumps and track through the, the various, so a core dump is, here's everything that's in memory, some of which are data, some of which are instruction. Here's where the thing uh, broke. I had a, an erroneous error. And you would track through, OK, how did it get to that state? So uh, um, debugging w was, at that point, fun. <laughs> it was puzzle solving. Uh, the, the most interesting, and so what we would do in the operating system world I is you would test for certain error conditions, and you would do a branch star, a, 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 a one instruction loop. Um, and it would freeze the machine. So you don't see it so much on this machine, but when I get to the 7094, uh, uh, the 36044, it had a limited number of lights here. So if all the lights in a certain place went on, that was because you had put it into this infinite loop. And then you would take, you'd write down the, the, the place where it was, you would take a chord dump. And the most interesting uh, uh, aspect of that uh, was we had a problem. Uh, we put in a, we, I couldn't debug it. We, I put in a test for, uh, for an error condition. And then I went off to uh, Rhode Island. About a year later, <laughs> somebody called me up and said, you know, that, that test worked. We found the error condition. And it was based on the fact that uh, a, a disk was getting full. They had replaced the old disk with a new disk, so it took it a year for that actually to trigger again. But uh, 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 that, was, that, that, that was the technique for the really hard problems. Yeah, so, so all this stuff, you know, debuggers and tracers and, and, and logs and log analysis, all crutches. <laughs> Necessary. You used to fill memory with a pattern. Then. Yeah. So, so what John just said was you would preload memory with a known pattern, and then as the program ran, uh, the places that weren't touched weren't affected by that known pattern so that you could find out, you know, it, it helped trace. So there were a bunch of techniques. There were, there were tools that actually would go through core dumps and uh, uh, give you more of a formatted uh, look at, at, at memory and so on. But you get these stacks of paper. And so when I went to Rhode Island, one of the things I did was, was I, I put some, I, I, I was doing some performance analysis uh, for research purposes, and I put some code in the production system. And the system would crash every once in a while. Uh, uh, nothing to do with me. And, and they would bring me a core dump, and I would let it sit on my desk for about three hours, and then I would go back and say, no, that's not what I did. Uh, <laughs> this was an IBM problem. <laughs> Well, that seemed pretty effective. <laughs> That's another thing that happened is it's not my problem. You know, so I, I talked about it's not my fault. You can also say it's not my problem. And, and, and 
Last night, somebody was telling me about uh, liability uh, with the Internet of Things. And, and so the, if, you, if you order all your pieces from the same company, up to and including the analysis program, something goes wrong, that company is responsible, IBM in, in the early days and other companies now. If you order it from other companies, which is going to be cheaper, uh, then you get into a long period of it's not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. And you have to kind of have techniques to, to manage that. Other, so this isn't quite what I envisioned, but other questions or, 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 or stories or, or whatever? It's, um, as an architect, I mean, many people would argue that uh, you uh, like in yesterday's talk, uh, Gregor's talk, you have to be able to ride the elevator, uh, ideally all the way down to where the code lives. So you should spend, to be able to, to sit together with a developer, uh, do some pair coding, for example, you, you need to be fluent in a language. Uh, you need to be familiar with the technologies. And at the, in a sizable company, there might be lots of technologies involved. People might introduce technologies uh, often, new things. Um, how how do you feel about that balance, and how realistic is it to expect from an architect to be intimately familiar with all the technologies used, the languages used, the code bases? Play? Okay, so there are two questions in that. One is we have the architect riding the elevator. That's a new phenomenon, as large organizations have adopted sort of architectural principles. Uh, uh, so large organizations, as Gregor said, have realized that they have become software companies and that software is the enabler. And that, so the software people are actually viewed much more positively in large companies than they used to be. So that's, that, that, that's one part of your question. Second part of your question it, it has to do with, with hands-on familiarity with technology. And so the, the, the architect is, is, is the head of a team. Okay, nobody's good at everything, except me, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so what you need to recognize are your limits. And so are your limits. What are you not good at? And so if somebody is working on a particular technology that you're not familiar with, you need to say that, find somebody in your team that can, that can deal with that particular problem. You know, so I mean, you hear these discussions about architects ought to do coding and this, that, and the other thing. And my perspective is that architects ought to have respect. People ought to respect them. If they respect them, then, you know, and, and, and they know their limits, then they will have people on the team to, uh, uh, to compensate. When I was putting together teams, I would always find somebody that was anal retentive. Okay, why? Because I tend to think in big pictures and I tend to make mistakes. And I need somebody to keep me honest. By the end of the project, I would hate them. <laughs> but they served a useful role, you know, because uh, they would always say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why don't you do this? You know, and that's good. That's good. I mean, again, it makes you hate them at the end but because uh, they're, they're a pain. But, uh, uh, that's, that's a useful thing. So that's me recognizing one of my limits. But uh, other people have other kinds of limits, and they need to be able to recognize them and compensate for it. So that, that's true about the technology. That's true about the people management. That's true about every aspect of being an architect. Other? Uh, okay, so uh, the question is, you mentioned the, uh, uh, kind of the origin of uh, ATAM method, how it came to play, and uh, I'm interested uh, in your view into the future of this ATAM method, this um, methodology that was uh, developed by SCI and you in particular. So what's the future of the methodologies? Uh, uh, developed by SEI. So somebody recently invited me to come talk about ATAM, then and now. 
Uh, uh, and I said, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> you know, I haven't been interested in ATAM in at least 10 years. I have no idea. Uh, but in general, thing, there are two things that happen to things like methods and practices. They either get absorbed into the community, and you know, that seems to be what's happened to QAW. Uh, um, other people pick them up, they improve them, they, they talk about them, they say this has worked for us, and you know, there's an evolution, or they got forgotten. Okay. Um, ATAM, as initially conceived, was pretty heavyweight. Uh, there's been a fair amount of work in terms of various people having lighter weight versions of ATAM distributed ATAM, you know, localized, special things. Um, the idea that you need to review a architecture, I think, is, is central. You know, uh, um, if you create an artifact, you ought to review it. Okay, an architecture is an artifact. And, and Jeremy was saying, you know, at Google and code, code does not go into production until it gets reviewed. So the idea of reviewing things is central. How do you review an architecture? Well, what's the purpose of an architecture? If you believe, as I do, that the purpose of the architecture is to control the various quality elements, then that's what you're going to review for. Uh, um, so I don't see those particular aspects dying. Um, you talked about CBAM. CBAM to my knowledge, has only existed when Rick Caseman is involved. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he is a, he is involved. He isn't. In our, in he wasn't involved in yours. Uh, I, no, I, I mean that he. I, I just had a small talk with him, and he basically says that uh, he's not involved with Sibam with further Sibam development anymore. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, uh, so that's a method that I haven't seen being taken up. Uh, the idea that there are cost-benefit trade-offs involved and that you need to understand the distinction between utility and cost and, 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 and have some method, I think, is, is going to be fundamental. So I, I, uh, I, I see that those concepts enduring. I'm not sure the methods per se will endure. I guess that's my general answer, is that the concepts that are embodied in those methods should endure. Uh, uh, the actual methods themselves, probably not, you know, in general. They'll get evolved, and, and, and as the world changes, then the methods will change if people find them useful. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> Okay, well, I'm slowly driving people away. Um, so, so it's getting to be almost lunchtime. So if there are no more pressing questions, why don't we call this quits? <laughs>